It's Sunday, July 1st, Canada Day, and this is episode 0.14 of At Mostly Linux on Mostly Gaming. Let's roll. And welcome back to another episode of Mostly Linux on Mostly Gaming. We are happy to be here on Canada Day, the day celebrated around the world by every country that wants to be more like Canada. You know, Canada is a bit of an underappreciated country. I mean, we're the, you know, small little brother of the big, uh, of the big uh, guy down south. Uh, it was uh, it was actually our current prime minister's father, who was also prime minister, Pierre Trudeau, uh, who said that, uh, uh, you know, be living next to the next door was like sleeping with an elephant, um, you know, which is true, especially if you're a mouse. Um, and we're, you know, as with many countries in the world, Canada is caught in a bit of a trade disagreement, let's say, with the Americans today. Uh, we, as a country, have imposed a raft of tariffs on American goods to get back at them for putting a whole bunch of taxes on our goods. And uh, it's unfortunate for both sides because, you know, while tariffs are meant to punish American industry, uh, as a response for American taxes punishing Canadian industry, the actual taxes are paid by your own people. So if, if a country puts tariffs on steel or on computers or on whatever, if, if your country, wherever you may be, puts tariffs on something, what that means is that you are paying the taxes. The tariffs are paid by the people living in the country the places the tariffs so it's basically just a tax hike so there's nothing to be happy about the fact that you know somebody's put tariffs uh all it means is that we all have to pay more for things that we like to buy and because things cost more we don't buy as much and that indirectly then hurts the producer of the other country but who wants to hurt people who wants to hurt people when we could all just get along, which is really what Canada Day is all about. You know, even people in Canada don't really understand Canada or Canada Day, but let me just kind of digress a little bit and kind of give you a little bit of the history of Canada because it is rather interesting that a largely English-speaking huge body of land north of the uh of, of of the united states with their calls for independence and freedom and liberty and manifest destiny seem to create a niche for itself in a country that is even bigger than they are at least by by land mass certainly not by population but there were a bunch of colonists across the continent uh, some of whom had greater grievances than the others and certainly the population centers uh, would have gone from um, probably the K Montreal the Quebec area there into the uh, what are now the Canadian Maritimes uh, down through New England and uh, to the American South uh, Virginia and so forth so so that's where most of the people were. The, the colonists, the 13 colonies that decided to get together were eventually what became uh, the United States. And for a number of reasons, the colonies that uh, did not join were not necessarily hostile to the idea, but in, in what, is, uh, what is now Quebec, back then it would have been uh, referred to as Lower Canada, uh, they spoke a different language. And the people in the Maritimes, those colonies were smaller and more distant uh, than, uh, than the New England colonies, 
uh, many of them being islands and, and areas that were a little less accessible. So Americans had their, uh, their revolution. Uh, they fought against uh, Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain mostly sent new forces, uh, Navy forces to fight the Americans. And long story short is we had the United States forming and their constitution uh, established uh, about a decade later. Um, maybe not that long, but, but around that period of time. Um, Canada, however, or what became Canada, uh, remained part of British North America, now a smaller, uh, a smaller component than, uh, than it was before because the United States was carved out of it. And the people that lived in Canada continued to be British subjects and continued to be subject to the British uh, uh, taxation that, uh, that the Americans uh, resented. Um, and in, but they were not necessarily hostile to the United States. They were probably quite friendly to them. Uh, there was probably a lot of a lot of relationships and a lot of uh, siblings, you know, on either sides of the border, and 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 really, you could walk and go back and forth. There wasn't like you know a border wall <laughs> like we're talking about today. Um, the next really big development would have been the War of eighteen twelve, uh, which was precipitated. Uh, Canadians see it. I mean, everybody kind of sees it in, in their own light in terms of whatever makes them look better. But, but Canadians see that as uh, an invasion of the Canadian colonies by the Americans uh, who wanted, uh, under what they referred to as Manifest Destiny, a, a, the entire continent to be American. And of course, the, uh, the British, because uh, there was no Canada at the time, it was a, it was colonies of Great Britain uh, fought back uh, and and uh, you know we uh, here see it as a victory uh, in which many uh, subjects Canadians uh, eventually uh, were able to fight back against the American invasion and um, and and ultimately defeat them uh, burning down the White House uh, along the way. Uh, at the end of this uh, battle, um, the at the end of this battle, uh, really being a separate country from from the United States really became entrenched, uh, and that that led to probably a a pass to which uh, these two groups would would inevitably become different countries rather than the same one. In 1837, however, there was a rebellion in Upper Canada, which is now Ontario, uh, that failed. And that, again, upon the failure of that rebellion, talk began about how do we uh, become our own country and separate ourselves now from, from the, dominus, the dominance of Great Britain. Uh, which led to confederation in 1867 and uh, at that point the, the the territories of canada were combined to form a country of canada and the and it was a negotiated uh, it was a negotiated separation from great britain the first such separation separation uh, in history in which a country was negotiated uh, out of the territory of of one's colonies, uh, that became uh, something that uh, uh, became more common uh, among the British colonies. But Canada was the first to effectively negotiate its way into into freedom. It became the Dominion of Canada, uh, having kept the uh, the sovereign as our head of state, being uh, today Queen Elizabeth II. And having a system of government that is that is similar to the the British system, but with with a uh, with a, a tool, a, 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 I guess a, 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 tool, a dual 
a, a two-tier system, similar to the Americans, where in the United States, each state had its own government, uh, unlike Great Britain, where the crown ruled all. There, there are, or, or there were back then, no different tiers of government in Great Britain. There was just parliament and the sovereign. And they have dominion over everything, not only over Great Britain, but over all of their colonies. Uh, the United States set up a structure where you had a federal government and a state government, and the rights uh, were 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 uh, split between them on various jurisdictions. And Canada did the same thing. While we kept Parliament, the parliamentary system, uh, we created a system whereby the provinces were more akin to U.S. states with an incredible amount of power. In fact, the Canadian provinces have most of the uh, legislative authority in Canada, but the federal government has most of the taxing and spending authority. And that split has led to both sides being constantly in conflict. I mean, that is the nature of Canadian federalism is that the provinces and the federal government are constantly at each other's throats. Uh, but they need to work together in, in the sense that in order for the provinces to be able to get access to the money that they require for all the programs that they're responsible for, they need access to taxation and abilities to tax, which are federal responsibility. And so typically what the federal government does is they tax and then make uh, certain demands or requirements uh, back to the provinces in terms of your your programs must meet these guidelines otherwise we won't give you back the money that we taxed your citizens which which is a cause of of concern but that is Canada that is Canada on Canada Day and it is a wonderful day to be Canadian and I'll be right back with the news in 10 seconds <music> Episode 0.14, mostly Linux on mostly gaming. Let's see what's going on. First of all, let me just kind of start off and say that I am using Linux Mint 19. Uh, this is the XFCE uh, edition. Uh, using the XFCE desktop environment. You know, I'm not a huge fan of Mint uh, generally. Um, I find that it is uh, yeah, a little on the ugly side. Um, and I'm a big fan of the look and feel of the, of the desktop. Uh, but uh, this S, uh, XFCE edition um, is is actually pretty cool. I changed the background here to be something a little less ugly than the default. And as you can see over here, I've got uh, uh, a Dark Souls stream running. Uh, I like this. I like uh, I like this version 19 of of, uh, of of Linux Mint and this XFCE uh, edition. I don't think it's going to stick. I don't think this is going to be my permanent. Uh, you know, uh, driver. Uh, I'm going to switch them up probably every week here on the podcast. But um, but this is good. You know, I'm 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 enjoying using it, <clears throat> and I'll use it for the rest of the week and and uh, you know see how it feels. Um, I've still got Manjaro uh, on the drive here, and. Um, you know, I like that. I'm I'm a big fan of Manjaro. I, I it took a few uh, tries for it to kind of stick for me, um, but uh, you know, once it did, I I like the flexibility and the freedom that it gives me. Uh, Mint, of course, is an Ubuntu-based uh, uh, distribution uh, with its own desktop environment uh, named Cinnamon. I'm not a fan of Cinnamon, which is why I've uh, switched it over here to X, uh, XFCE. I think they've got an XFCE version, they've got a, Ma, uh, a Mate version, and they've got their Cinnamon versions. Um, this uh, um, this version the uh, just came out yesterday, and so I decided to give it a shot. Um, 
But anyway, let's go to the news here. Uh, first of all, we're into the World Cup. And what does everybody that wants to basically follow the World Cup need? How about a way to check your World Cup scores on Linux with some neat apps? Uh, this information comes from OMG Ubuntu. And basically there's a couple of ways. I'll go through a couple of them. Uh, and I'll be a little respectful of the people that are listening to this on audio uh, as well by, by being a little bit more descriptive. Uh, but there is a, there's a link uh, here for uh, OMG Ubuntu. Uh, you can just kind of search the site there, 2018 FIFA World Cup, uh, and you can kind of get access or take a look at these apps. The first one, probably the easiest one, is there is a... Um, uh, a known uh, uh, a World Cup indicator on uh, if you're using uh, GNOME as your desktop environment. Uh, it's an extension for GNOME and they have a link here that basically allows you to connect with it. I'm not using GNOME so I'm not going to use this extension but it basically it's it's a um, it's a it's a desktop app. It's an extension that basically is on your desktop and it gives you scores of the games that are on. Uh, live scores. Um, I think it updates. Uh, it says here that there are collapsible sections which list scores for all games played today, the results of matches played yesterday, and at a glance info for any matches being played tomorrow, which is pretty cool. They've also got some you know flag colors and so forth so you can identify who's who. That's the way to do it. If you're using GNOME or have access to GNOME uh, extensions, what you want to do is you want to come over here to this uh, site or, or search uh, GNOME extensions for World Cup indicator and stick that on your desktop. If you don't have a GNOME or don't need any little fancy desktop in it, indicators because you live in the command line on your terminal, anything outside of the terminal is for noobs, right? Right? Well, then there is a command line version as well. Uh, the one that I'm using is something called Wow Cup, and I'll kind of put it in here. It's a little bit of a hassle to set it up. Uh, you have to install NPM, but there's instructions here on the site to basically walk you through that. Uh, just be aware that in order to run NPM install, uh, you have to be root. So, so the instructions in the guide here uh, ask for you to basically, you know, type in, you know, sudo app get install npm which would be your first uh, command once that runs through uh, you need to go sudo npm install uh, uh, dash g wow cup uh, you can see it here on the screen uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't kind of specify here though that you should you need to be root so it's not just npm install it has to be sudo npm install dash g wow cup once you've got that in there, and I've got my terminal up on the screen right now, you can just basically run wow cup fixtures and you've got your scores and the games that are basically running. So, so what this does is it gives you a nice little kind of graphic for 2018 FIFA World Cup uh, in, your, in your terminal. And then it has the scores for all of the games that have been played recently, plus all of the games that are uh, playing. So right now I can see that France is playing Argentina and it is nil nil. That game started at 10 a.m. Uh, so I'm gonna put this terminal over here and we can follow the scores in real time as they come. That's a cool little, uh, cool little app. Cool little command line interface. Uh, if you're uh, a World Cup fan, um, you know, that's the way to do it. Now, with, with the command line, you're gonna have to reload it to basically get updated scores uh, rather than having them, you know, change in real time as with the GNOME extension. Uh, but you know what? Some people prefer one, some people prefer tea, some pr people prefer coffee, and some people prefer wine. We're going to talk about wine later. Uh, anyway, that's it. Let's take a look at what other news we've got on the agenda today. I guess probably the the maybe the most shocking news is 
that uh, Gen 2 was hacked. Gen 2 was hacked. I don't think I've got uh, the link here right now. Let me just do a quick search. Gen 2 was hacked. Gen 2 is, of course, a Linux distribution. And uh, apparently somebody hacked the github uh, for it and I do not I do not use gen 2 I don't know uh, you know who does use it or how popular it is I, I mean I hear it a lot but I see very few people actually using it but uh, going through to the article here on slash gear it says popular popular Linux distribution gen 2 has been hacked with a company warning that its github repository should be considered compromised Unknown hackers took control of the GitHub account earlier this week on June 28th and modified both pages and the OS data there. Uh, GitHub is a web-based hosting service used by many thousands of projects to host their code. It is often used as a version control system with several iterations of software still preserved online. Uh, GitHub, of course, was acquired by Microsoft a few weeks ago. So the so so what they are saying here is that do not use the github repository the code there has been compromised and a number of malicious code changes have been spotted already the get the gen 2 foundation took about two hours to get regain support of the account um but even then it's basically warning that the code saved there was considered suspect they do have backups of the code of course um, and we'll relaunch the non-compromised version, uh, but really kind of unfortunate to see this happen. And uh, kudos to uh, kudos to the uh, uh, Gentoo Foundation for responding so quickly uh, to basically get this out there and, and prevent anybody. Well, I'm not sure if anybody was 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 compromised. If you if you installed or downloaded or even visited uh, the um, GitHub for Gen2, you, you might want to just basically take some precautions on your, uh, on your system. Um, but maybe what you need to do is just go cloud. You know, maybe if everything was on the cloud, we wouldn't have to worry about anything ever. And certainly that is what Google seems to be thinking because Noted labor activist Jason Schreier of Kotaku uh, did a little digging and he mentioned, so he basically published this article on Kotaku uh, that Google is planning a game platform that could take on Xbox and PlayStation. And I think if this is true, this is big, big news. I'm still suspect as to whether it is true um, I, I, you know, when we say take on Xbox and PlayStation, you know, we typically think of something powerful, something, you know, something that is going to be competitive with, with PC gaming. But I think, uh, based on the article here that what Google has in mind is what Jason Schreier, uh, sorry, what noted, uh, labor activist Jason Schreier refers to as a uh, three-pronged approach. Uh, one, uh, introduce some sort of a streaming platform. Uh, two, some sort of hardware. And three, an attempt to bring game developers under the Google umbrella, uh, whether it's through aggressive recruiting or even major acquisition. So basically some kind of streaming, some kind of hardware, and then bringing on some gaming, uh, some games. Um, which interestingly enough sounds vaguely similar to the speculation for the Xbox consoles that uh, were mentioned at uh, Microsoft's E3 uh, presentation. They, they refer to the next generation as consoles rather than singular console. And so the speculation there is that perhaps Microsoft is going to be launching a family of products, perhaps including a streaming box. Uh, along with a hardware box. And now we see from Google that 
at least from uh, noted labor activist Jason Schreier's uh, article here that he uh, the Google may be doing the same thing. Uh, he goes on to basically say that you know in recent months the chatter about Google has gotten louder. I'm reading from the uh, from his article now. At the Game Developers Conference in March of this year, Google representatives met with several big video game companies to gauge interest in its streaming platform, which is codenamed Yeti. Uh, Google also took meetings at E3 in Los Angeles a week ago, uh, and from what we've heard, the company is looking not just to woo game developers to the Yeti service, but to buy development studios entirely. And of course, we also saw that Microsoft bought five of them uh, and announced them at E3. Um, so this would be something like uh, NVIDIA's GeForce Now. Um, you would effectively stream it. Uh, again, you know, it, 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 it's similar to GeForce Now. There's PlayStation Now, of course, as well. Uh, you know, we all know what streaming is like with the lag, but apparently, um, you know, with this, uh, there was one person that is quoted as saying uh, that, you know, imagine playing The Witcher 3 within a tab on Google Chrome. That would be magic, but that would be magic for Linux. Look, I am a big fan of these, uh, of the trend to streaming because, because if it weans us away from a reliance on, on, Windows platform, we can then play all of our games through these technologies in Linux. I won't say native, but in, in Linux uh, without having to go out to uh, Windows to dual boot or use Wine or any of the other things that we have to do right now. Of course, native is always going to be better, but this may be better than using uh, wine or dual booting. So anything that gives us more options is a plus for me in my way of thinking. And uh, you know, certainly I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how this uh, develops. Uh, there, there seems to be a lot of that. How will, for example, Microsoft, if it's a streaming service, prevent uh, you from streaming it on, on other operating systems? Presumably what they're going to do is basically offer you the streaming box and then you can only do it through the box or perhaps there will be an app that you need to download on Windows 10. I suspect that's the case, but you know, does that make any sense? I don't, I mean, Microsoft has always, you know, uh, cut off its nose to spite its face in the sense of trying to use Windows to corner the market and that's becoming less and less effective. Um, so, so I'm interested to see how this kind of works out. Uh, you know, in the meantime, Veronix has done some, uh, test results where they, uh, they ran, let me just go to the first page here, uh, Windows 10 versus Ubuntu Linux with OpenGL and Vulkan on a GTX 1060 and 1080 Ti and an RX 580 Vega 64. So, so these are comparisons between Windows 10 and Linux using OpenGL and Vulkan drivers. Of course, Linux cannot do the, uh, direct uh, X. Uh, so, so these are the, uh, are the drivers that are available to, to both sides. And, and overall, it was very, very interesting to see Linux basically kick butt pretty well across the board. Um, certainly Dota 2, uh, we see all of the uh, graphics cards outperform on Linux relative to uh, Windows, both in Vulkan and OpenGL. And we see that as well in, um, uh, you know, across the different resolutions. It seems like the benefit seems to decline as the resolution gets higher. Although here we can see that at the, with the 1080 Ti, it is getting still, uh, you know, at 4K resolution under Vulkan, nearly uh, 30 some odd percent more 
uh, frame rates than uh, than Windows. And you know, a big part of this is also the optimization that Valve has done for their games. Uh, but you know, there's Open Arena here, similar stats. It looks like Portal is a little more favoring Windows. But by and large, um, uh, Linux is is kicking uh, butt here on properly optimized games that are available for both platforms. I mean, take a look at X uh, Plane 11. It, the, the OpenGL test results at 1080p resolution, you're getting more than double the frame rates under Linux, more than double the frame rates. Not as good under Vulkan, um, but that's those are uh, those are very interesting uh, statistics. Uh, you can see those those uh, blue bars here. Um, anyway, it just kind of goes to show that you know under equivalent circumstances of optimization and so forth, uh, Linux is the better operating system. I you know I mean there's just uh, I. The, like that is so obvious now that it's not even a subject of debate really by anybody anymore. Um, last year on the news feed, I want to touch on Firefox uh, 61. Um, if you are not using Firefox, you really should take another look at it. Uh, Firefox, uh, Firefox has made some terrific strides uh, with the uh, launch of version 60. Uh, which was codenamed Quantum. And in this latest version, they've done a couple, uh, several actually very important, small changes, but big ones in terms of their impact. Um, one change uh, is called uh, Retained Display Lists. I'm reading this from CNET, uh, which works by not forgetting work the browser has already done constructing the view of a website for your screen. So instead of recalculating everything when part of the page changes, it only recalculates the parts that changed. And by doing that, it, it increases the render speed dramatically. Um, it says here that it cuts the time needed to spit out pixels for the screen by 33%, which is huge. Uh, the other big change is tab warming. Uh, which is an interesting idea. What that does is it lowers uh, delays that might annoy you when switching from one tab to another. It notices when you're moving your mouse pointer over to a different tab and anticipating that you're likely to want to see it, start stuffing a finished version of the website into your computer's memory for fast display when you click. So you can see here that my mouse was over my Twitter feed and it rendered it over. Uh, I guess it seems to be pretty fast to me. I'm not sure how much of an impact that's going to make. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a neat idea. And there's a quote here from uh, Mozilla programmer Mike Conley, who says, uh, maybe this is my Canadian-ness showing, but I like to think of it almost like coming in from shoveling snow off the driveway and somebody inside has already made hot chocolate for you because they know you'd probably be cold. Touche, Mike Conley here on Canada Day. Uh, anyway, we'll be back in 10 seconds uh, with a, taking a look at some recommended new releases and what's coming up on Steam. <laughs> for sticking with us here on episode 14 of Mostly Linux on Mostly Gaming. Steam sale continues to go on and on and on and on up until July the 5th when it will be officially over. And uh, we have given out so far, I'm going to say maybe 8 to 10 games. Typically, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, the uh, at, at our group uh, here. We're taking a look at the members, and we are occasionally just popping on, seeing who's uh, on at any specific period of time, and taking a look at their 
uh, at their wish list and gifting them a game from it. You know, usually we're not going to go out and spend 50 bucks a person, but we are, you know, kind of, I think, anywhere from a few dollars to maybe $20 in terms of the list. I, I, I'm not keeping uh, track, uh, per se, of, uh, of, of the money in and out and so forth, but uh, probably north of $100 is probably what we've given away. I think we're going to start tapering it down. Uh, I'm a little over my budget uh, myself with uh, with the Steam sale. I picked up a crap ton of games that I'm never going to play, including rounding out my Final Fantasy uh, collection. So now I've got all of the Final Fantasy games from 3 uh, up to the most recent one, which is 15. Um, in my collection, I've been playing a little bit of uh, Final Fantasy 12. Um, and, and enjoying that, I played that when it came out on, um, when it came out on, uh, PlayStation 2 many, many years ago. And, uh, I didn't actually finish it, but really enjoyed it. It's kind of an interesting uh, story. I think I'm going to go with Final Fantasy 12, finish that. I also picked up um, Neo, the complete edition. Have not played that. I think it looks like it says 22 minutes. I've not played 22 minutes. I think that's just basically testing it on wine. Uh, I picked up Surviving Mars and put up a uh, little time in that. This is a very, very cool game. Um, but man, it's tough. It's tough. It's, uh, it's, it's making me want to cry. It's very hard, and uh, I don't know. I'm just. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not smart enough for it. I don't know. Maybe I don't give it enough time that it uh, requires. I also picked up uh, BattleTech, which uh, looks like I've given it nine minutes. I'm not playing BattleTech. I'm gonna wait for that to come out on Linux. I, I did buy it because it's on sale at a decent price and I've been keeping my eyes out on it for some time. Um, it's on sale for 20% off. So not a huge discount. I, I would say you probably don't need to run out and get it right now. Uh, my, my kind of sense is that it's probably gonna be released for Linux in the next couple of weeks and uh, I'll load it up and play it there uh, then at that time. Um, in terms of what's out, you know, with, with the summer sale running, uh, there isn't um, there isn't a lot of things that are coming out because nobody wants to come out when everything is on sale on Steam for 70% off or whatever. Um, actually, this Shadow Tactics here, 50% off. That Shadow Tactics, for anybody that's got a Twitch Prime account, of course, you can get that for free from Twitch Prime. Um, but let's take a look. Why don't we take a look here quickly and see if they have released any new games this week. Uh, 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 let's go to the store. Okay, let's try this again. Games. <laughs> Steam OS plus Linux. Seriously, uh, Valve, you gotta, you gotta make your platform make more sense. So if you kind of, I was getting confused there, of course, because there's three layers of drop down menus on, on Steam. So up here at the top, we've got something that says Steam, which is change account, you know, view, friends, games, help. So that's one line. And then right underneath that, they've got another row of drop down menus that say store, library, community, and then your 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 username with 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 groups and badges and that kind of thing, and then beneath that there is another row of drop down menus that begins with your store, games, software. Of course, games is also in the top row, but that game in the top row where it says games is a different menu than the games that it says at the bottom row. And so, is it any wonder when we're trying to find stuff on Steam, it's completely confusing? Um, but anyway, let's take a look and see what's new and trending. Oh, here's something new, newish. Starlight Drifter. Let's take a look. 
star right drifter is content may not be appropriate interesting let me just take a quick read uh, create your own character and explore the universe in the sci-fi space game allowing you to choose where to explore and what to do where your decisions will affect the universe and the ending you experience i'll run the trailer here just really briefly <laughs> So that's uh, that's Starlight Drifter. Um, let's make sure we've got all our settings here properly set up. Um, yeah, looks all right. I mean, it's it's thirty five percent off this week. I mean, it it probably doesn't do them any good to launch uh, on June 29th during a Steam sale. Uh, the reviews are mostly positive. I will. Ah, you know what? Let me put it on my just so that I don't forget it forever, uh, because I will if I don't put it on my wish list. Um, what else do we got? What else do we got? Up left, uh, uh, MOBA GM, MOBA GM, MOBA GM, twenty three bucks. Okay, so that takes some balls, right? Uh, they release this thing, whatever it is, for twenty three bucks, no sale. In the middle of a steam sale probably some kind of an app uh, the premier single-player MOBA esports management simulation game customized players teams and champions unlimited number of leagues and seasons choose to do your own in-game drafting so it's kind of like a fantasy sport thing for esports it's kind of an interesting thing um, 29th of June really the two user reviews. I mean, I just really you're gonna release it now with no sale. I mean, okay. I mean, good luck to you. It's not for me, but uh, you know, it, there's all kinds of gamers out there, and it's also got a Linux version. So uh, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, give it a shot. Um, that's it. I'm not gonna look through any more of the games. The games are what they are. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the focus all week and for the rest of the week is going to be on the Steam sale. And I think there's, uh, you know, if you're out there and you're looking for some good stuff, uh, yeah, take a look at the Final Fantasy games. They're not native on Linux, of course, but um, they are all pretty well 50% off if you're into uh, RPGs. Uh, I'm really enjoying Surviving Mars. I think your mileage may vary depending on uh, on um, whether you like uh, games like City Skylines, but it's very, very similar to that. Uh, and Neo, um, gosh, I've been wanting to play that for a very long time, along with Battletech. And uh, sometime between now and my 80th birthday, I will uh, endeavor to basically get both of them done. Uh, maybe, maybe that's uh, maybe that's a little too generous. Maybe before my ninetieth birthday. Um, uh, in any case, you know our focus on topic today is going to be uh, the Linux system for Windows gaming, is what we're referring to it. And basically, what it, we're going to focus on is how to properly game on Windows to get the best out of your dual booting system. Uh, so I'm going to come back on the other side in Windows. Catch you on the other side. And welcome back to at Mostly Windows on Mostly Gaming. Episode 0 0.14. No, never. No, we're actually here on Windows to show you how to set this operating system up to be optimized for your dual boot. 
Uh, you can see here that I have set this up already. First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, when you are setting up your system at the menu at the beginning that uh, Microsoft asks you for permission to spy on you, to look at everything that you do and to collect the data so that it can target you better with ads and know everything about everything that you're doing. Say no to everything. That might make you feel good, but Microsoft is smarter than that. You think these guys are dumb? These guys aren't dumb. They know you're gonna say no to all of that stuff. So after, the first thing that you wanna do when you install your new Windows system on your dual boot is you want to basically get rid of Microsoft's shenanigans. And you, and you do that by basically popping into your uh, settings. Just go into your little Windows box here and type in privacy settings. That will pop up the real list of privacy settings. The list at the very beginning there is not the real list. That is a list, just a short list of some of the key things that at the very least Microsoft wants to know about. But if you pop into where it says privacy settings, you see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, two dozen, two dozen additional settings that were not included. Some, there's some overlap, but, but by and large, all of these default to on regardless of what you say at the beginning. Inclu so you begin with general and turn them all off. Speech, diagnostics, activity history, uh, where even if you say no, these are turned on so that Windows collects activities from your PC and sends them back to Microsoft. It shows activities from your accounts. Um, I'm going to just clear my activity history. And then through, all the way down, it tracks your location, it tracks your camera, it tracks your microphone, your notifications, your accounts, your call history, everything. Everything here defaults to on. We had a philosophical divide on Linux with Ubuntu, uh, with Canonical's decision to have one setting on Ubuntu to default to on for them to get the most limited and transparent amount of data possible. And it split the community. And even though it defaults to on, more than a third of the users have basically switched that off. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what we try to avoid when we use Linux. This is insidious and this is frankly bullshit. Turn them all off. If any of these things are relevant, to, are relevant to something that you are using, let's say, for example, the microphone, you've turned that off and you want to use the microphone that I'm like I'm using right now, Microsoft will let you know and you will be able to turn it on and then you can turn it off again if you like or you can keep it on. But Microsoft will let you know if you have turned off a setting that you are trying to use. They want all of these things to be on. So turn them off unless you agree with all of the terms, but I suspect you haven't read them. And if you haven't read the terms, you might as well not agree to them by using them. Okay, so that's the first step. Second step is there is a host of open source applications that are both on Linux and on Windows, beginning with Firefox. Download your favorite browser, whether it's Firefox or something else, I continue to recommend Firefox uh, as, as being the best option, but your mileage may vary. Then go to other apps that have uh, Windows uh, versions. For example, I've got VLC here. I've got GIMP uh, also has a Windows version. Of course, uh, OBS Studio has a Windows version. Set up your apps particularly those key apps that you use uh, that are default for the system. And, and then you, for, for all intents and purposes, are gonna feel like your workflow hasn't changed very much because your primary apps are there. Uh, 
what I did here is I also changed the background to a uh, KDE Plasma background. I hate the Windows background. You can see the default Windows background over here. It's ugly. I was mentioning uh, earlier on about uh, Linux Mint that I didn't like that background. I don't know. I'm a background guy. <laughs> and uh, and having a uh, Linux background makes me makes me feel better. Uh, makes me feel just yeah, less foreign here in Windows. Uh, but once you've got your app set up, those key apps that I said, go into default app settings and switch Microsoft's default to your selection. So web browser, I've switched uh, to Firefox here. Microsoft will complain when you change this. They will complain when you change this and they will complain every time the Edge browser ever gets launched. Um, they really want you to use Edge, but uh, it's not good. I mean, that's your problem, Microsoft, is you're making things that aren't good. Uh, you know, I've got the VLC uh, player here for video, photo. I've switched them out so that my apps are replacing Microsoft apps. I haven't switched the maps and the email because I don't plan to use maps and email on this on this uh, machine here, at least not in Windows. Um, so switch them up, and then you should be reasonably comfortable with the fact that when you're doing stuff, the apps that you're, you're used to basically using are also popping up. Um, next, what you want to do is you want to install your games. Uh, so I have, you can see here, I have uh, installed the installers. So Battle.net, Epic, uh, GeForce, uh, actually, GeForce, do not install GeForce. Let me kind of get back to you. GeForce uh, is not required for you to update your drivers. A lot of people use it for that. What GeForce is, is telemetry data for NVIDIA. What, what, what NVIDIA wants is they want access to all the games that you play, how you play them, your settings, your hardware, your software, and all of that kind of stuff. It is, it's basically, it's a Trojan horse. So do not install GeForce Experience. When there is a driver update, you will get it through your normal Windows update. There is no reason to ever run GeForce Experience. What you should do is if you want, if you want to stream, use OBS, which is what I'm using right now. OBS has uh, APIs for Twitch, for Mixer, for everything that you need out there for YouTube, uh, for streaming and for recording. So use that and protect your data. Um, and, and that's really kind of the nature of proprietary operating systems. Everybody trying to basically sneak in with something that seems really nice so that they can grab your data. Um, so resist that where you can. The other thing is Microsoft, of course, does the same thing. They've got what is called a game mode. Game mode. Let me actually just go to the settings instead. And then we can kind of get into it through there. Um, turn game mode off as well. Uh, in terms of the 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 game, uh, the gaming, um, uh, the game bar. That's what it's called. The game bar basically is the GeForce experience, but built into Windows as part of the operating system. And what it does is every time you run a game, this Windows thing pops up asking you to use Windows to basically stream your game. Um, and so just turn that off. Go to uh, settings, game bar, turn that off. Uh, they've got a game DVR. Uh, that should also be turned off. Uh, game mode is okay. I, I, don't, I don't turn that off uh, largely because it seems to help with Microsoft's uh, stupid problem of popping up other apps when you're trying to play a game and then halting your entire game experience. I don't think it completely works, but uh, uh, I can't really figure out how to turn it off anyway. Um, Xbox networking cannot be turned off. Uh, True Play, you can turn that off. Just basically turn off all the game mode stuff. Nobody needs to know, I guess, you know, that is not central to the platform that you're gaming on, i.e., you know, Steam or Origin or whatever. They will know what you're playing, but why let everybody else is trying to be a hanger on? Like these guys don't have their own um, 
game store. They're not selling you the games and they're trying to basically fake that they're adding value so that you can basically be tricked into giving them your data. So just turn them off and, and don't use them. Um, anyway, once you've installed all of your uh, uh, launchers, uh, launch them up and install your games. So here I have uh, just launched um, just launched Steam. And what I've done is I have installed a bunch of the games that are not uh, native to Linux on it. Um, and uh, I'll play them over here. And you can basically play them, have fun, do what you want, and then quit and go back to Linux. And once you've set them up, you see here I've got a bunch of games that I've installed. Once you've set them up, Join me back on the Linux side and I'll show you how to optimize Linux for Windows gaming. 10 seconds. BRB. And we're back to the beautiful beautiful Linux Mint 19 XFCE OS just feels good to be home doesn't it I had to take a shower I took a shower in fact I did I had to clean myself of that <laughs> um, Anyway, let's come back over. We are back over here on Linux after having set up our dual boot on uh, Windows. Now let's. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna pop in here to the terminal, and I'm going to run Steam from the terminal uh, rather than from the line over there. I just want to be able to see what's happening to it as it's coming through. Um, And that's getting up. Now, what I'm doing here is, of course, I'm running native Steam on my Linux desktop here. This is not uh, Weinstein. Um, and um, and so what I have here, these are basically my, if I go to my Steam OS Linux games, you can see that I have uh, a bunch of the games kind of installed here on uh, Linux. In fact, um, that might not be all of them, but but the Linux games I try to play native on uh, Linux. So let's kind of kill that. I'm going to make sure actually that my disk is mounted. Um, so let me just go over there. Now, Mounted your disks, if you've got multiple drives or partitions on your system, they may not all be mounted when you launch. There is a way to set that up. I'm not going to get into all of those details right here, but I do have a uh, drive that is named Games, and uh, that just mounted. It wasn't mounted before. So if I run Steam again, I believe I will find all of the games now reflected including the ones that are uh, available on this secondary drive okay so now that it's mounted let's run steam again connecting the account <clears throat> Okay, and there we go. So now you've got every game here. So I've got every game <laughs> that I own <clears throat> on um, Linux over here, native on my native Steam uh, application. So I don't need to basically put any of these on the Windows uh, on the Windows Dual Boot because I've already got them here. So let's quit that. Okay, goodbye to those. We like you, native Steam. But let's take a look now. I know that we've got a dual boot, but what if we're over here in Linux and we don't feel like dual booting? And we've installed a whole bunch of our games over on this drive on the other partition. Are some of them, I mean, maybe we just want to play some of them over here. 
Maybe some of them work fine over here. Maybe we don't have to reinstall them on Linux to be able to play them. And maybe we can play the games from our Windows partition here on Linux. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run Lutris and show you how to basically get that done. First of all, download and install Lutris and set it up. And, and this will pop in. These are all of those Linux games that I just uh, that I just basically showed you that are on my drive. So it finds all, Lutris will find all of those, and I can basically click on this and run any game that I want right here from uh, Lutris. And frankly, this is in many cases more uh, convenient than basically having to run up. Uh, Steam and look for the game. I mean, it's got nice little pictures here. I can basically find what I want. Now, if you go and set up your Steam, your Windows side as well, uh, you see that it's come up empty. You've got a whole bunch of Windows games already available on this drive. They're already installed. You've got Steam installed, but Lutris doesn't know where they are. And if you could tell Lutris where those Windows games are, wouldn't it be cool if you can access your Windows version of Steam that you installed on that Windows partition and then be able to access those games, install games, change games, delete games, and play games right here on Linux using your Windows partition. Um, yeah, you can do that, which is pretty cool. So what you want to do is you want to go to your Wine Steam. First of all, you want to you want to go into Lutris. You want to import your game. So make sure that these are all set on uh, for Steam and Steam for Windows. And then you want to basically go to your runners and uh, install uh, Steam. You are going to install Steam and I have not figured out yet how to basically do it without installing a second copy of Wine Steam on Linux. Um, unfortunately, that's what I do. If anybody knows of a better way to basically link it to the uh, Windows version without having to install it over here as well, uh, please let me know. But for now, it's not a very big, uh, it's not a very big app. It's not gonna take up a lot of data. So just go to Wine Steam, uh, install it. It'll set it up and of course, there's no games in it, so so it won't show up anything over here. But then what you want to do is you want to configure it, and you want to configure it by basically setting up the settings that you want. So you can see here that I've got it set up as Wine Staging 3.1 and so forth. Uh, you, I've enabled DXVK, version 0.54 is a default. And then what you want to do is the custom Steam location. What you want to do here is you want to connect it to the Steam location on your uh, Windows partition. So I'm going to kill this here because I have not mounted the partition. And this is the way it's going to look for you as well before you connect your Wine Steam. So connect the Wine Steam, find your, uh, you, you can basically find the path to your Windows partition, to your Steam directory, and link to it. Then, once you have mounted the drive and relaunched uh, Lutris, let's just go over here. The drive that I have my Windows information on is this one right here. Now it's mounted, okay? You can set it up to auto mount, by the way, if you, if you kind of want to do that. But now that I've mounted it, it is accessible to Linux. And when I run Lutris again, it will synchronize all of my games from my Windows partition over here. And I haven't done this yet, so hopefully it's going to work. Let's go to Windows. Boom! There they are. Okay, so these are the Windows games on my Windows partition that I installed on that side of the wall. And to the extent 
this is not going to work. So what this is not doing is, you know, some kind of a virtual machine where you're playing them on Windows or anything. This is not what's happening here, okay? You are just basically accessing the data that is on your hard drive that you installed from the Windows side. And to the extent that these games are set up and can work at Wine, you can play them over here. Now the performance isn't going to be as good over here as it will be on running them native on Windows, but if you don't want to dual boot and jump out over there, and you're happy with playing them over here, uh, you can do so. So let's check out Kingdom Come Deliverance. I'll check up the settings here. So I, I, I had set this up earlier. So these are the game options. Uh, they're going to default from my uh, default window setting. In fact, I'm going to set this up to uh, DXVK version 61. Uh, that's how you change it, by the way. You just change that version right there, and it will fix it up for you. Now let's save this, and let's run it and see if it works. Don't make a liar out of me, KCD. Okay, now it is updating Steam. This is updating the Steam on our Windows partition. So the update here will cross over uh, to there as well. It's installing an update. Interestingly, it's already connected uh, with my password and it didn't need me to basically verify the Steam install over here as well. And there we go, Kingdom Come Deliverance. Let's just see if we go straight into the game here. It is, it is pretty cool in the sense that, you know, you can obviously pop into Windows to play some of those games that absolutely are not gonna work over here on Linux. Uh, but if uh, if the game works over here and it works well enough, like uh, uh, KCD does, um, there's really no reason to go back over to uh, to Windows. And, and you can see here, it looks like it's running just fine. It looks gorgeous, in fact. Um, All right, so we're just going to pop out of that. So that, I mean, basically, you know, you can see that there are a number of things that you can do to make your gaming in uh, Windows a little more effective, even if you don't want to use Windows. And uh, by setting it up this way, you really minimize uh, the telemetry and some of the other kind of, you know, pain in the ass things on the Windows side. Uh, but then you're getting some traction in terms of being able to install your games over there, use those that are playable over here, um, or if you just don't want to pop into Windows, and then for those games that are absolutely, um, you know, uh, not playable in Linux, then you can, you know, uh, go on over there. Meanwhile, this game is, is gorgeous. I'm running it at 4K at high settings in Linux Mint. Um, looks like I'm getting about 28 frames per second. I can probably fix that up a little bit by moving around with the settings uh, or playing it at 1080p. I could probably get 60 for sure. Uh, but you know, I mean, it's pretty good. I mean, I could always pop into Windows and run it over there if I, if I, you know, I'm not happy with the frame rates over here. Uh, but the fact that I can play my games, my Windows games over here on Linux if I don't feel like popping into Windows, is is quite, quite good. Uh, let's get out of here. And with that, I'm going to take one last break and come back with some final thoughts. And we're back here. Some final thoughts. I hope uh, I hope that uh, you know you guys found some of that helpful. I can tell you that it's taken me 
you know, quite a bit of going back and forth and booting and changing and trying and testing. I do more kind of just messing around with, with settings than I do playing games. Um, and I figured I'd share some of my information uh, with with the rest of you that are kind of, you know, more casualish uh, Linux gamers rather than, you know, the sys uh, admin guys that know everything about everything. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert, right? So I kind of hack around and I try to figure this stuff out. And I think I've done a reasonably good job of having a system that works uh, well. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, kiss a Canadian today if you uh, know of one. And if you don't, then what's wrong with you? Find the Canadian and kiss him. Happy Canada Day to the world. See you next week.